in this video, Idiot Atheist Reads Christian Literature, we'll do the eternal security of the born-again believer by Dr. Curtis Hudson. You can get these from Sword of the Lord. Feel free to like, subscribe, feel free to watch any of my other videos, feel free to please check the description, read the description, feel free to leave a comment. I don't read comments. I don't know who does, but you know, maybe somebody will read your comment. There you go. Eternal security of the born again believer. No way, I'm not going to read every single word. I never do in any of the other videos. You know, everywhere I go, I find people troubled because they do not know that they are secure. They think that because of their sins, their negligence, their failing to endure to the end, or some other reason, they may lose their salvation. As you can imagine, there are kind of two camps in Christianity those that believe that you're saved, always saved. And those believe you can lose your salvation if you sin. I've already made other videos about it, you know, and who really cares? They both can't be right, but they both can be wrong, and they're both wrong because there's no such thing as being saved. It's what you're being saved from. But the thing is, though, people who, the, the ones that believe once saved, always saved, people accuse them of, you know, easy believism, you know, you, they, you could sin or do whatever you want as long as you're saved, but that's not actually what they believe. They believe that once you're saved, you're a child of God. If you sin, God will punish you. Sometimes severely. Sometimes even cost you your life. That's basically what they believe. Other people that believe that you can lose your salvation, you know, people may call it like, well, you think that God just gives you something and then takes it away. Then what's the point of getting saved? You might as well get knocked on the head and die immediately because you're going to sin, right? And you could die as you're committing a sin. It doesn't matter. It's all fairy tale. Perhaps they have taken the word of someone whom they trust. Or they have not studied the Bible carefully. And that's another thing. Both sides have studied the Bible carefully and can point to passages that prove their point. Like the famous one in James, you know, faith without works is dead and all that stuff. You know, and both of them will give you their interpretation. I'm not going to give you my interpretation because I do not give a crap. <laughs> but they use that. But you can watch the Christian videos and you know and find out what they both sides think that verse means. You know, the Catholics, the Protestants, the Protestants are divided and always saved or lose your salvation. The first group, those who believe that a leading let's see the leading a poor Christian life will result in a loss of their Salvation actually needs to have the plan of salvation made clear to them. Somehow they have not completely understood that Jesus Christ fully paid for all of our sins when he died on the cross and that our conduct or good works have nothing to do with salvation. Of course we ought to live good and God has ways of dealing with disobedient children. See? But we are saved by trusting Jesus Christ as Savior. John 3.36 He that believeth on the Son has the everlasting life. It is a clear cut problem with grace or works. Ephesians 2.8.9 makes it plain, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. <coughs> God promised and God produced eternal life. John 3, 14, 16 says, And Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, and, and that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life, for God so loved the world. Oh yeah, I was supposed to say Jesus, said Jesus, sorry. That he may give his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And again in Titus verse 2 we read, In the hope of eternal life which God cannot lie, promised before the world began. And you know, we got other Bible verses. First John 5, chapter 5, 10, and 11. John chapter 10, 27, 20 through 29. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. And they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them. Out of my hands, out of my father's hands, or whatever. Let's see. Out of my hands, my father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hands. And then, of course, is Romans six twenty three. Great, ain't it? Bible verse. Of course, you can go to King James Bible Online dot org, and you can um, uh, see these verses for yourself. A Bible believer has exactly what God promised and produced. Many scriptures make it unmistakably plain that the man who is trusting Jesus Christ as Savior has eternal life. John 5, 24, blah, 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 I say unto you, and has everlasting life. 
Verily, verily, I say unto you, that he that heareth my word and believeth on him, that sit me hath the everlasting life. Notice the Bible it does not say he that believeth on the Son will have. It says hath. But notice that Jesus goes a little further than saying that everlasting life. He makes it devilish sure in verse John 5, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my voice and believeth on him that sit me has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation. But it's passed from death unto life. In addition to saying that the believer has everlasting life the moment he believes Jesus has a promise that he shall not come into condemnation. That is a sense of sin will never be put on the believer again. Wow, ain't that nice? So basically, go ahead, murder, rape, commit all the crimes you want, treat people like garbage, you know, be a vile, nasty, rude person, you know, walk in front of people in malls and stuff, you know, don't try moving out people's way, be a horrible person driving and just be nasty, go off on a guy that says hi to you or opens a door for you, just be a nasty, mean-spirited person, you know, just be disgusting, you know, so, you know, you're at a grocery store, someone actually touches some of your stuff and you just start cussing at them, you know, you're working, you know, you're in an emergency room, you know, blame racism for you having to wait longer than everybody else. Or, you know, somebody's with their girlfriend and their name gets called at, uh, let's say, what restaurant do we want to pick? What restaurant? Not, what was that restaurant? Whatever. It doesn't matter. Nice restaurant. They get up, you blame racism, call them racist because they're getting up, even though they're getting up to get their seat, but call them racist for getting up because you think they're being, trying to move from you. Be that type of person. But you'll still go to heaven, just make sure you get saved before you die. And of course you can be that sweet person, cure diseases, help disabled children, and all this stuff. Cure people, help the homeless, and you'll go to hell for not getting saved. You can kick little kids and puppies and all that stuff and go to heaven as long as you get saved before you die. That's Christianity. And a beautiful religion. And a beautiful religion. That's how most religions kind of work in a way. However, some of I'm well in Christianity anyways, Catholic, whatever. Most other religions, it's you know that you know you have to be good. You have to worship. You got to do this and that. Charity. You can't. Do that other if you, the other stuff may still send you to hell. You know, I don't know. I don't care. Actually, I do know because I get the books on it. But you know, I'm just saying. In addition to saying that the believer has everlasting life, the moment he believes Jesus as his promise, oh, we already read that book. But the condemned criminal is the man who has been arrested, tried, and had sentence passed upon him. He is under the sentence. He is condemned. The sentence for sin is death. Romans six verse twenty three says the wages of sin is death. That death is describes the in the Bible as the second death, the lake of fire. Revelations 20 verse 14, death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. One second. I want to show you something. The name of the restaurant I was thinking about is called Outback. Sorry, wrong book. I do suggest this book. It's actually a good one. It's called The Bible, if you can find it. It'll History, Geography, Worship. It's actually a pretty good book. This is the one I'm thinking of. Mythology. Myths, Legends, and Fable. Fa uh, fantasies. This is actually a very good book, too. You know, all the fairy tales, which is all the religions, all of them. Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, all that is in that book. Mythology. This one, I... Well, you get these at Sweetwater Press. You know, it's where you'll find them. I guess part of white privilege is being accused of being a racist simply for getting up going to your <laughs> seat. Or, you know, old man has a heart attack and gets rushed to the emergency room. And then, you know, you say, well, that hospital is racist for allowing, you know, the guy, a white man with a heart attack go in, in there while I just have a, you know, a cut. But, oh, well. Well, I'm not going to be on that too much. But now Jesus says, The man who believes on Christ not only has had the census lifted, he is not condemned, but he further promises that he shall not come into condemnation. The census of sin will never again be placed on the believer. Ain't that sweet? God not only gives eternal life, but promises that the believer will never perish. John 10, 28 says, And I give unto them eternal life. 
and they shall never perish, neither shall any. Now pluck them out of my hand. And I know that one of the things that may happen in the comment section is you're going to have people arguing, oh, you can leave, lose your salvation, they'll give verses and all this stuff, and other group. I argue that, oh, you can't. I don't care if you do that because I won't be reading comments, but no one cares. Who freaking cares? It's a fairy tale, anyways. When you look up the word never, which occurs in John 10 23 in the Strong's Concordance, and I have the Strong's Concordance. On page 715, you find that it comes from four different Greek words, which spelled in English letters are blah, 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 blah. Looking up each of these words in turn in the Strong's Concordance, and we're not going to go through that part. But the meaning of all these root words together, and you put the find that when Christ said never here in this verse, it carries with it very powerful assurance. More than one word never ordinary carries with it in our mind. And we're not going to go through all these words because I don't know if you can see them. You probably can't. You know, I don't, you know it's, if you can, you know, fine. You can try to read this as best you can. Looking at John 28 with, his, with this additional light, we could write it this way. And it gives this emphasis Christ did when he spoke it. And I give unto eternal life that they shall, n shall not at all by any means, in any case, in any place, at any time, for any purpose, whether they are male or female, perpetually or eternally, ever perish. That's basically what they're trying to say, never. Believers are kept by God. They do not keep themselves. The Bible makes it plain, plain again and again that the believer is kept by God. If we had to keep ourselves, I would admit that we could be, we could be lost again. and probably would be. In one of Spurgeon's sermons, he said, If it should ever come to pass that sheep, the sheep of God could fall away, alas, my fickle, feeble souls would fall ten thousand times. No, we cannot keep ourselves. Thank God we are kept by God himself. In 2 Timothy 1.12 Paul asks, For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Here the apostle says, I am persuaded, that is, I am thoroughly convinced that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto that unto him. It is my business to trust Jesus Christ as Savior. It is his business to keep me. 1 Peter 1, 3-5 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In these verses we are told that the inheritance is reserved for us and that we are reserved to or kept for the inheritance. The Bible says to an inheritance incorruptible. That means that it is not corrupt, will not decay. There have been occasions on earth when men have received a great inheritance, but when the liars, the courts, and the state were finished, the majority of the inheritance had faded away. But here the Bible says our inheritance faded not away. Wow. Several years ago, I was discussing eternal security with another preacher. In the course of the conversation, I read John 10, 28, Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. The preacher interrupted and said, Yes, but the Bible does not say that we cannot get out of his hand. I responded, You do not build doctrine on what the Bible doesn't say. Rather, you build it on what the Bible does say. I continue, The Bible says, Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. You are a man, aren't you? Why, yes, he said, in that case you should, could not pluck yourself out of his hand either because the Bible says, any man. John 6, 39, you can read that. Colossians 3, 3, for ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ and God according to this verse, blah, blah, blah. Jesus, well, sorry, Jesus is the, is the Savior. Please watch my video, you know, Jesus melted on the pizza for your sins. He is referred to as Savior at least 24 times in the New Testament. Titus 2.13 says, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus, Jesus Christ. Now, what is a Savior? Suppose you are drowning. There, there you are in the middle of the ocean. Suppose somehow someone threw you a book and told three lessons on how to swim. Would he be a Savior? No, perhaps you could call him an educator. You could not call him a Savior. Suppose another man came by, got out of his boat, jumped in alongside you, and demonstrated various swimming strokes, showing you exactly how to swim. Would he be a savior? Of course not. He might be a good example and give a good demonstration, but he's not a savior. 
What if he lifted you into his boat, dried you off and gave you dry clothes, fed you, took you within 10 miles of the shore, then threw you out again to the ocean? Would he be a savior? Absolutely not. A savior is one who takes you safely all the way to the shore. And God says he gives you eternal life and he, and he will never cast you out or lose you. He means it because he is a true savior. There is not a verse in the Bible that teaches that God places the believer in a position to be saved provided he does other things. No, no. The Bible says he saves the believer. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call, shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, of course, those of you who believe you can lose your salvation, you can read this, and it isn't going to convince you any more than a person who believes that you're once saved, always saved, can read any of your literature, and then come to your camp. Because the Holy Spirit is telling you one thing, the Holy Spirit is telling them one thing, the Holy Spirit is telling the Catholics one thing, and the Mormons one thing, the Jehovah Witnesses one thing, and all these other people. And like I did a challenge before, and that the pizza melted on the cheese uh, for your sins. Take anything, a pizza, a slice of pizza, I don't care what it is, a teddy bear, a la, some weights, I don't care, I don't care. Do that sinner's prayer or the Lord's prayer. But replace Jesus with that. You'll still get the rush of euphoria that you get when you think you're being saved. I dare any of you to do that. Especially those of you who claim to be saved and Christian. And, the Holy, and you know because you know because you know. Well, you could know because you know. You could know that Jesus, that Jesus melted on your pizza for your sins. Jesus died for all our sins. Many of those who believe that you can lose your salvation think that you lose it for some sin you commit after you're saved. Several years ago I had an experience that I don't believe I shall ever forget. It was Thursday night and I was out soul winning. Oh, I like this one. I had been t asked to make a visit at a certain address. When I knocked on the door, I was greeted by a friendly gentleman in a business suit. When I went inside, I saw there were four other men present. Oh, man, I, you know this never happened. I had been there only a few minutes when one of one of the men, men said, Oh, you Baptist, you believe once saved, always saved. You are wrong about that. I knew then that the men were preachers and that I had been invited to the home simply to argue eternal security. I said, Now, man, I do not use the expression once saved, always saved. But I do believe in the eternal security of the born-again believer. That is, the man who has trusted Jesus, Jesus Christ as Savior is secure. He can never lose the salvation. Oh, they argued. Yes, he could. I quoted him a number of verses, and they quoted verses back to me. <laughs> I love that part. After some time, I asked, Well, if a man could be lost, lost after he is saved, what would he have to do to be lost? Merely one of them said, Get out into sin, and the others agreed. I said, All right, you are saying that if a man goes back into sin after he is saved, he is, then he is lost. Yes, that is right, was a quick reply. All right, I have several questions for me. First, you did invite me here tonight to argue about eternal security, didn't you? Yes, that's right. You knew that Thursday night is the night I always go soul winning, didn't you? Yes, we did. How would they know that? Don't you think it would be a good thing if you had let me go soul winning tonight instead of inviting me here for the sake of arguing about eternal security? They agreed it would. I continued. You men are preachers. Don't you think it would have been good if you had gone soul winning instead of setting up this meeting with me? They agreed it would have been good. Unlikely they would have been squirming and arguing and stuff. Open my Bible to James 4.17 and read, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doth it not, to him it is. And I asked them to read the last word. They stuttered a moment and quoted other verse. I said, No, no, I want you to tell me what James 4.17 says. To him that knoweth to do good, and doth it not, to him it is. What finally word them said, Sin. And according to this verse, you are sinning right now, because you know it would have been good if you had gone so many, and if you had allowed me to go ahead with my soul winning visits tonight. According to this verse, you're all sitting. According to your teaching, you're all lost. Oh no, they said no, but you have admitted that you are sinning. Oh, we know it, but said one of them, we have not sinned enough or enough yet. See, that's not necessarily what those people that believe you can lose your salvation believe. They believe any sin. You know, you could be lying or something. And you have to... I mean, it depends on them. Some of them might agree with this, but some of them can be any sin, lie, a simple lie. Can you imagine that type of salvation, though, if you're a Christian, that any sin or sinning can send you to hell, cost you salvation? What would be the point of getting saved if you can lose your salvation? That makes no freaking sense. 
Luckily, there's no such thing, so you don't got to worry about it. I smiled and said, take this Bible and show me where it teaches how much sin you have to commit to be lost. Of course, I could not find such a verse. Truth of the matter is, Jesus Christ died for all our sin. First, G, First Peter 2.24 says, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Isaiah 53 verse 6 says, The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Uh, please check out the Bible, the Bible Skeptic, the Bible Reloaded, the Koran Reloaded, Logic, Armored Skeptic, and Aaron Raw, The Atheist Experience, and Matt Delante. Their channels, please. Every sin I've ever committed or ever will commit was laid on Jesus two thousand Jesus two thousand years ago. I told a lady that once when she died, I can understand now he died for my sin. I'm sorry, let me read this again. I told a lady that once, and she said, I can understand that how he died for my past sins, but I cannot understand how he died for my future sins that I have not even committed yet. I smiled and said, Lady, when Jesus Christ died, all your sins were future. You were not even born yet. I guess you are right, she said. I said, I know I am right, unless you are a very old lady. She laughed and smiled. Well, I'm not that old. God chastises the believers who sin. Look at Hebrews 12, 6 through 8. For whom the Lord loveth, he chastises and scourges every son whom he receives. If he endure our chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chastises not? But if he be without chastisement, we're off all our partakers, being our bastards and not sons. Basically, if you claim to be a Christian and you're sinning, you're cussing and arguing and drinking and God's not punishing you, that's because you're not really saved. And as they all say, is, you know, God doesn't whip the devil's children. So if you're not saved, you're the devil's child. <laughs> Notice in these verses the words son and sons. Notice the expression, God deals with you as a son. From the moment you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, God will never again deal with you as a sinner. From that moment on, He will deal with you as a son. And the Bible plainly says, He chastises every son whom He receiveth. <coughs> if the, the believer sins after he's saved, God will chastise him. Sometimes this chastisement takes the form of sickness or even death, as in the case of Corinthians 11.30, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Not all sickness is chastisement, but in many cases it is. God's chastisement takes various forms, which I will not have space to discuss in this article. That's why you'll get some of these pre preachers, these hurricanes are because of sodomy and gay marriage and gay pride and gay this, gay that, this hur hurricane and the nuclear explosion, you know, the baptismal, whatever it is, the nuclear reactor in Japan that cracked and everything because of an earthquake. Because of sin, sin, sin. It's basically because of this type of stuff. Because they believe that the United States was a Christian nation. I'm supposed to say to my son, now son, don't play ball in the front yard. You may break the window in the front of the house. When I'm away in a revival meeting, my son disobeys me. Plays ball in the front yard and breaks the window. When I get home, I ask, son, did you break the window? Yes, dad, I did. All right, dad, did I tell you I would spank you if you broke it? Well, no, because all you just says not to do it. But oh well. Yes, sir, you did, and I will have to do what I told you. Now you come with me. Wow. Of course, a better way would have your son to do a lot of chores and stuff, to pay for the window, so they have the idea that they have to pay for it. Even if they're like five years old. <clears throat> you know, if you're giving your child an allowance or buying them gifts, well, you're not going to get these toys. You're going to do this work, and because, you know, you've got to earn the money, and you go pay for the window. Eh. Seemed like it would, I mean, just my opinion, that seems like a better punishment. Because then they learn the value of it, why you do not break the window. If you're just spanking, what are they going to learn? Nothing. But if they have to pay for the window, they realize, hey, this costs money. This costs my father money, or my mother money, to have this window replaced. You got, you can fix it yourself, or you got to have a professional fix it, or however you want to do it. But it costs money, and it takes time. Of course, if your child's a little older, you can have them fix it. If you think your child can do it. I take my son into the back room and give him a good spanking. Does the spanking pay for the window? Absolutely not. I don't care how much I spank the boy. It will never pay for the window. When I finish chastising him, I will have to 
reach into my pocket, take out the money, and pay the man to replace the window. I chastised my boy, but I paid for the window. Which, of course, again, like I said, that's a poor analogy. <laughs> Stupid. If the believer sins after he's saved, God will chastise him. But the chastisement is not payment for sin. Je Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ paid for our sins 2,000 years ago when he died on the cross. Oh, goodness. There is no end to the hypothetical questions. I've been asked over and over again, but what if, what if, blah, 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 what if, blah, 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 what if, what if, what if, what if. Just trust Jesus Christ, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, here's a simple prayer, okay? I want to, I'm just going to say the prayer, but what I'm going to do is replace the word Jesus, what is this, Jesus, with Jesus. So if you want to say the prayer with me, you can, whenever I say the word Jesus, you can replace it with any word. Pizza, Jesus, Allah, baseball, whatever. Watch, you'll get the same, especially if you're like, have your eyes closed and your hands up like that. Something like that. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner. I do believe that you died for me, and the best I know how I do trust you as my Savior. From this minute on, I, I'm depending on you to get to, me to heaven. Now help me to live for you and be a good Christian. Of course, you can replace the word Christian with anything else. Amen. And you, can say, you don't have to say this exact prayer. It could be anything else. You know, I know I'm a sinner. I know you melted on the cheek pizza for my sins, please forgive me of my sins, I accept your sacrifice, you know. Even now I'm getting a little for a feeling. It's amazing, it's because, you know, you expect it. <laughs> Even if you're not expecting it, you're going to get it. It's just how it is, you know. Just... The eternal security of the born-again believer. Thank you.